If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So, Justin, you're, you're the one that got in contact with uh, with Chad, right? Yeah. Yeah, I reached out. Um, my friend Corey that we had on, Corey Schlesinger, uh, recommended uh, Chad because... Well, and I knew of, of juggernaut training systems before. I mean, anybody who's in the powerlifting world, the Olympic lifting world has heard of juggernaut. I mean, they're, they're all over. They put out quality, uh, strength, very high level stuff, high level information. One of the few publications, online publications that you you know, is, is coming out with quality stuff. These guys know what they're talking about. Um, and it was a fun, it was a good podcast. I mean, we got pretty deep into, into, into lifting, deep into training, um, I liked it. I liked it when we talked about the the stuff about kids. Ha- hands yes. down, the best part of this entire mm-hmm. podcast. Um, if we lose you at the beginning, because it is a little bit slower, uh, the inf- and the information is pretty high level and specific to strength training. But I think uh, anybody and everybody that uh, either was a kid at one point and played sports or has a kid that is playing sports or thinking about playing sports, there's a must-listen-to mm-hmm. section uh, that, I, I mean, there's... I call it nugget bombs. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of times where we get a guest, uh, especially in the fitness world, where I'm like I'm intently listening because I I have no clue on what the best answer is for this discussion. And oh, he, I learned a lot right there. Right, so did I. So yeah. he, he goes into, you know, literally from five years old up to adulthood... Uh, kind of what the cadence of um, training would look like and sports would look like for the ideal performance long term for that athlete, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is counter to it's counterintuitive to what most people would think. So, if if you at all are into sports or have a kid that's into sports, um, I, I, I I you know I highly recommend listening to at least that section. It's of, like in the middle back half of the episode. Yeah, good I would say. good good section of this yeah, for sure. But, but you know, good good strength uh, information, good stuff for power lifters and athletes. Um, and uh, again, he's this guy is an incredible resource of good quality uh, information. Now he is the host of the uh, uh, of the the Jug Life podcast. Jug Life. They have a YouTube channel, really good quality um, strength information, Juggernaut Training Systems. That's how you find them on YouTube. His uh, The Instagram is Ch- uh, Chad Wesley Smith. So that's at Chad Wesley Smith. And you can also find their official Instagram page for the company at Juggernaut Training. Um, I also would like to, rec- uh, to remind everybody that this month, MAPS Anabolic, which is our foundational strength building, metabolism boosting, muscle building fitness program is 50% off. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code RED50, R-E-D-5-0 for the 50% off discount. Um, And you can also take a look at our other MAPS programs. Uh, One of the best ways to get your body to respond to training and get your body to improve rapidly is to train yourself appropriately according to your current fitness level um, and your goals. And so we have different fitness programs on that site, um, one of which will be best for your body. You can find all of that at mapsfitnessproducts.com. So without any further ado, here we are interviewing Chad Wesley Smith of Juggernaut Training Systems. Chad, where where are you located at? Costa Mesa. Okay. So not a bad fight for you either, yeah? Yeah, we're we're coming up here this weekend already. Oh, no shit. Yeah, so... uh, do a seminar tomorrow afternoon and Sunday uh, in Oakland. Where at in Oakland? Who's at a gym or where yeah, you at? Yeah, at a Max's gym. So Max Ada, very creative gym naming. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then going, going today from here up to do some stuff with the 49ers. Oh, nice. Are you going to the, the new 49er gym? Uh, we're going to Levi. Oh, okay. Have you did you see that they just opened their uh, their first like collab, right? So it's a gym. Uh, Mark Mastroff is doing a line with the NFL, and they just opened the Forty Nine er Fit Gym, which is here in Santa Clara, which I think okay. it's really close to there. So you'll probably, I imagine, yeah. you guys will probably go buy it. Maybe A Rod was there yesterday. I know they just had the big launch for it. So yeah, that, when that, are we going to go there? I know, we're supposed to. Yeah. They have a turnover on the on the staff. They they fired the head strength coach. So. Oh really? Oh really? Yeah. I didn't know that. So do you uh, do you go and do like consulting for a lot of places and gyms? Because I, I mean, I'll, just a, the little bit of background that I have on you. I mean, 
as far as uh, you know, strength and powerlifting, you guys have been, in my opinion, one of the most credible, best resources yeah. on YouTube that I've ever found. And Thank so um, I would imagine you probably go around and help out a lot of other gyms. Any powerlifter I know always refers me to your guys' stuff. So, yeah. The, uh, yeah, you know, when I started out, we did a lot more stuff in sport performance than uh, we have, have recently, but I'm getting back into doing more of that. So done some stuff with the 49ers, with the Rams, um, just yesterday, Wednesday did like a coaching education thing for the Mamba sports Academy. Uh, it was a crazy facility that Kobe Bryant, it was just called sports Academy before and Kobe Bryant invested in it maybe six months ago, hmm. hundred, hundred thousand square foot facility in thousand Oaks. What? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's sick or what? Uh, is it ridiculous? <laughs> yeah. It's got, you know, tons of volleyball courts, basketball courts, cause they're hosting tournaments there as well as doing combine prep and coaching oh, okay. you know from little kids to grandmas they got jujitsu school in there physical therapy like one-stop shop they the have, full gamut they have a esports training facility when i had seen that on the website that's like, creeping in we just sports, started talking yeah. about that yeah we had a guy on that was like trying to explain to us how insanely popular this is and how much money's oh, yeah. being thrown at it now from even professional teams they, they sell out you know they're, they're selling out basketball arenas mm -hmm. and some of the features i've seen on espn <laughs> it's 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 crazy to see but at the same time as someone involved in powerlifting and weightlifting it's just like Man, they're getting fifteen thousand people to show up for a fifteen million dollar, you know, grand prize for people to play fucking video games. <laughs> yeah, right. Mario and, Brothers. Yeah. And it, I'm and, squatting a thousand pounds. What the <laughs> hell? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it wasn't, that's really impressive. Yeah, you know, it, it was only five years ago that USA Weightlifting had their national championships in a roller rink in Akron, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> so wow perspective when you go and you you work with these professional teams uh these professional football teams what are some of the things that you help them on i mean i, I would i would imagine at that high level um it gets very specific on the things that you can even help them with yeah you know i mean it's just kind of whatever questions the coach has and they want to talk about i think they're, they're for the most part people are going to look to me to juggernaut as like all right how do we get our players maximally strong mm -hmm. but to be honest that is not that important of a quality for nfl football players like they're gonna be strong enough but even the strongest nfl player isn't gonna blow you know blow you away in terms of of powerlifting numbers mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm much more interested in and my background is track and field much more interested in about how to manage all aspects of you know skill acquisition alongside the physical preparation and, you know, really figuring out exercises with the highest transfer of, of training. So, you know, really, really high dynamic correspondence because, yeah, bench, bench press, squat, that stuff, it's all well and good. And, and you're not going to have a really successful NFL player who's like bad at those things. But I saw enough. I've seen enough times with athletes that I've worked with in the NFL who I could bench, you know, even offense linemen, guys who played, you know, a, a buddy who played at SC and then for the Raiders for a couple of years, he was benching 350 when I was benching 550. He was squatting, mm. you know, 450 when I was squatting 850. I could jump higher than him, jump farther than him. But when he came out of a, of a out of a three point stance and and threw a double hand punch, that was really fast and really hard and way harder than I could do it. Mm. And that's the skill that he needs. Mm. So if benching more and squatting more and general jumps and stuff isn't transferring that highly, which granted this is only like N one example, but how can we find exercises that mimic the direction, duration, velocity of the sporting movement to get better transfer? And that, that's something mm -hmm. that looking back at my own track and field career, uh, you know, if I could go back in time and change things, I had this huge bench, huge squat, huge vertical jump, all this stuff. But I was like, there are other guys who can't do that stuff as well as me, but they're throwing the shot put farther. Mm -hmm. So how are they doing that? Are they throwing heavier shots, lighter shots, you know, more rotational strength drills, things that aren't maybe like as sexy to measure. No one's like, well, what's your best, uh, you know, barbell standing barbell twist. No one ever asked that. Yeah. And I'd be like, well, I bench 500 and I squat 750, but that barbell twist had a lot more, 
reason why they were throwing 70 feet and I was throwing 65. What are some of the exercises that you're seeing that are giving people or athletes the biggest carryover? I mean, as trainers, we, when we train, we train average people. We don't train, uh, I've, I've trained very few high, high level athletes. And when I train the average person, a squat has a huge carryover for them. Just getting them to be able to squat and then mm-hmm. getting the stronger at the squat, I could see lots of carryover. But when you're working with that level of performance, what exercises are you finding? Are there are there movements that you're finding that have incredible carryover that maybe the average person wouldn't even consider? Um, you know, to, to paint with a broad brush on those kind of movements would be a bit tough because it's going to be so specific to not just a sport, but a position Sure, w- uh, within that sport as well. But, you know, how, how we're going to classify exercises, and this all goes back to uh, Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk, who's the the na- the national throws coach for the Soviet Union for 25 years, coached the two best hammer throwers of all time, and really sort of revolutionized this idea of special strength rather than just, all right, I'm going to get this hammer thrower to squat as much as he can, snatch and clean as much as he can. We can actually take those numbers down to about 70% of what he previously thought because now we're going to throw heavy hammer on the short wire and these different rotational type of drills. So he classified exercises, general preparatory, general developmental, special preparatory, mm. special developmental, competitive exercise. Oh, interesting. Mm. So competitive exercise is the, is the sport. That's the, the tip of the pyramid. I've heard you talk about this pyramid of speci- yeah. uh, uh, specificity. And uh, yeah, if you could yeah. go into that even a little further. Yeah. So if you, if you were to think about exercise selection and athlete qualification as a, as a pyramid, the tip of the pyramid is the competitive exercise is the most specific thing you can do. And give an example of that, like for a sport. So we, so the uh, listener understands. So let's take uh, weightlifting as, as the example, this is kind of a simple one. If the Bulgarian system, the most specific training maximums, multiple times, daily maximums, snatch, clean and jerk squat or front squat. That's all they would do. But, and, and Ilya Ilyan, you know, is, is the best example of this because he in his career went through this entire pyramid. So, so as we look at the, let's actually go ground up on the pyramid day one base of the pyramid, very broad. The most people are there was the broadest and the most exercises will possibly transfer to their, to their improvement. So let's say that, you know, if you think back to the, the first day you were the, you know, the first month that you lifted or, someone who's brand new to training, all of the exercise they could do that would improve their squat. Of, of course, any squatting variation, you know, lunges, leg extensions, leg press, goblet squat, tons of different mobility exercises, probably just fucking thinking about squatting would improve their squat at that point. As they become more qualified and, and like better at squatting, the exercise selection starts to narrow. Now, thinking about squatting, leg extension, stuff like that. Well, maybe that might not help as much or at all. You get higher and higher on that. It continues to, to be more focused. And then it's going to basically just be squatting and very close variations to it are going to have a big, a big carryover for them. So back to the weightlifting example, I uh, first heard Ilya Ilyan speak at a seminar in uh, late 2013. And, uh, yeah, I think late late 2013, late 2012, one or the other. And he talked about when he started weightlifting, he was five, five, six years old. And his mom sent him to the weightlifting club with his older brother because he was like hyperactive and he would just run around the house. So she's like, oh, get out of here. So now he said he would run around the gym and do all the exercises. And that probably didn't mean that six-year-old Ilya had free reign of playtime in a Kazakh weightlifting gym, but it meant that he did very broad preparation, like the base of the pyramid Mm because it's six Mm -hmm. years old. So of course it's the, it's the bottom. So he's doing stuff like gymnastics based drills, all kinds of calisthenics, swimming, jumping track and field based drills, playing games, doing weightlifting technique. And then so by the time that he was 18, he had no relative weakness. So he began training in the Bulgarian style three, you know, probably 11 to 16 sessions per week. So some double days, some triple days, snatch to maximum, clean and jerk to maximum, front squat to maximum. Three hours later, same thing. Three hours later, same thing. 
his progression from running around the gym to do all the exercises to the most specific training possible, you know, wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't, well, I just ran around the gym and did all the exercises. And then on my 18th birthday, they're like, no, only these ones now, you know, it just changed in proportion as he went hmm. because those general phases of training, gymnastics, swimming, and, and that kind of stuff, things he still does to this day, they didn't have direct transfer to his snatch and clean and jerk performance like they would have earlier. Right. So the same thing when you get, you know, high level NFL player, MMA fighter, whatever it is, all those exercises can have their place at the right time during, during the year. But when you're, you know, a month out from, from starting or you're in training camp or something, is it worth the energy to try and put 10 pounds on, on a guy's bench press or mm-hmm. 20 pounds on a squat? Right. Is that going to make him better? Or is this, you know, five yard sled push from his stance going to make him better or, or different explosive med ball throws where he's, you know, punching with two hands, that kind of stuff. That's going to have a much higher transfer. That makes a lot of sense. I've heard a lot of strength coaches actually talk about the importance of basically introducing these young athletes to as many sports as possible. Oh yeah. And then starting to refine the process and specializing uh, later on as they mature. Is that similar to how uh, you grew up? And I, I know you were involved in a lot of sports, but kind of take us back to that. Yeah, you were a track guy, you said, right? Because yeah. you look just like a cross country runner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe two or three. Maybe two really? or three of them. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. So for me personally, you know, I kind of lucked into my parents yeah, you know, they weren't like, all right, this is how we're going to make Chad into a good athlete. I just did a lot of sports and, and a lot of them turned out to be ones that are very helpful. Uh, you know, I started playing soccer and all that stuff organized when I was five years old and then started track and field at eight years old. And at that time I ran the 50 meters and hundred meters, four by 100 relay and through the shot put. And I was just doing that cause it was like, oh, my friend started doing track the year before and he's good. So we'll go hang out with Kevin and it'll be a good time. And then, uh, I did track from when I was eight till I was 23 and, uh, eventually dropped the, the 50 and the hundred, but not till I was like 13, 14 years old. Uh, when I started to get bigger in high school, even I'm always proud of this. When we were 13, we were Southern California four by 100 champions for white boys from, from Irvine. Oh, wow. So that was mostly mm. just, we had good technique on the handoffs, but still got the W so yeah, I did track, did you know, basketball, soccer, uh, then high school played football and track and field, and then went to University of California Berkeley on a track scholarship. So the shot put was there for two years, junior college for a year, and then uh, finished my last two years at a small NAIA school in Southern California called Concordia, where I ended up throwing sixty three ten in college, and then one year as a post collegiate through sixty five seven. Uh, but at that point, 2009 had started Juggernaut, 10 year anniversary this year. Oh, wow. congrats. And, uh, thank you. I, I, I had kind of forgotten about that until as writing the date on something that January 2nd or hmm. it was like 1, 2, 9, 18. Wasn't that well, hashtag 10 year challenge thing? <laughs> no, it wasn't that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, of course I wrote 2018 and I was like, no, 2019. I was like, 2019. Oh, we started a company 10 years ago. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what was That's the goal? Crazy. What was the goal when you started uh, Juggernaut? Yeah. So, you know, we started as a sport performance gym. Uh, so it's a physical location. Yeah. Train people. Yeah. Um, at, at that point, I was still doing still doing track. Uh, I realized through the first about nine months of that, I was like, well, I'm working about 65 hours a week here. All the other people who are trying to go to the Olympics for the shot put, they just throw the shot put all day. So I don't think this is going to work out. <laughs> um, so from the business side of, side of stuff, we just wanted to, to train athletes. You know, uh, Joe DeFranco was like the really big influence on me the summer before my senior year of college. So uh, summer of 2008, I was in New York visiting my brother and uh, you know, rented a car and made what was essentially a religious pilgrimage for me to New Jersey to go to Joe DeFranco's oh. gym. And uh, a couple months ago, I was doing, this, doing a seminar or doing a podcast with him. And we got to reminisce over that. And, awesome. I, you know, I made like a YouTube vlog out of it before that was really a thing. Unfortunately, the the music on it now, YouTube like took, we'll let you. Air yeah. It. So it's, it's just like silent uh, <laughs> on the video now. But mm-hmm. uh, but that's what I wanted to do is exactly what he did, uh, you know, was train football players and do 
combine prep and train MMA fighters and all these badass people. And, you know, we did that for three years in that original location. But into 2010, uh, I wrote the Juggernaut Method ebook, like the first one that I'd done. I did my first powerlifting meet. And with the success of that book at the time, I was like, well, you know, training people in person is really cool, but we're never going to have more than 120, 150 people that we see here every month. There's tens of thousands of people that have bought this book. Plus, I didn't have to pay rent to sell it. Said, so maybe this internet thing, it'll, it'll be a <laughs> something deal. How'd you get the idea to write? Cause it's back in 2010, not that long ago, but in, uh, I guess new media internet land in, in, you know, promoting yourself online. Mm -hmm. It kind of is right. Like, Oh, where, man, it where feels like you, a lifetime, multiple lifetimes ago. Where did you get the idea to do that? Uh, you know, at the time I was on elite FTS, I'd been on there for about two years and, uh, there were a couple other people doing ebooks. Basically, like Jim Wendler had five three one, and I was just like, "Oh, that seems like a good idea." You know, we have this program, the Juggernaut Method program that I had written and we we're using with sort of the majority of our clientele, which were high school athletes from various sports, and it was just like a good kind of base beginner intermediate program for them. So. It was, I just asked, asked Dave Tate, I think I was like, Hey, sh like, should I make this into a book? And probably the, the guy who was even the bigger influence on it was, uh, a guy named Bob Island felt, uh, some people would know him as Rob Fitzgerald or the angry coach. Um, I think I remember that. Yeah. So he wrote for elite FTS. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of stuff for them under different pseudonyms and, and, uh, like ghost writing things, but he was also the senior editor of muscle and fitness. So right as I had gotten onto Elite, he had taken that job and and moved out to Southern California, and I was like the only person he he knew out there, for a guy who is the most New York person imaginable. Like yeah. you know, had been like NYPD, <laughs> you know, coached football, coached lacrosse out there, just a gristled New York man, Grizzly guy, yeah, and very angry. But uh, so his angry coach nickname was apropos. But he, he uh, was also an excellent writer and he kind of encouraged me towards that. And I showed him the program and he's like, oh, yeah, this will be this will be great. It'll be a hit. Now, wh what made you want to do it online? Oh, uh, I mean, because like, you guys have a huge presence. Well, he, he made yeah. the comment that, you know, at what one point he he noticed that the gym is only going to fit about 150 people in there. Yeah. And the book was reaching thousands of people. I think the light bulb probably yeah. just went off like. If I want to make some good money doing this, this is probably the direction yeah, to go. Smart move. Yeah, and there, there was just a lot with the, the you know, everyone, or not everyone, but so many people, I think more so at that time too, had seen people like Joe DeFranco and Zach Evan Esch and were like, yeah, I want to have this hardcore, you know, warehouse gym and do that. And there's so much that comes along with it that's not just training, you know, as badass athletes. There's a lot of, you know, hours in the day where those people can't train. It's very hard to make a, a, yeah. a small box very successful. Yeah. You know, people, people just assume that, you know, with, with all the flash and shit that, Oh, there's yeah. a lot of money in this, you yeah. know, there yeah. really isn't. It's tough. Yeah. And there's a lot of bathrooms to clean and taxes <laughs> to do and all that kind of bullshit too. So, you know, uh, uh, we finished the lease there in, in late 2012. And at that point I'd started training a lot more football players, which is what I really enjoyed the most. And I was like, this, I can train just this group and focus on our, on our online stuff. So, uh, our lease ended, moved out of that place, sublet from another, another gym. So I could just train football players. And the group that I really liked was I get high school seniors as you know, the day after their season finished and get them ready to go to college, to go play college football. Oh, that's cool. So in two, in two years, we had an inc incredibly comprehensive program. I'd see these guys two to three hours a day, five to six days a week, nutrition, mobility, on, on field, speed and agility in the weight room, you know, every, everything about it, like as, as, or more comprehensive than what we had even done for NFL combine prep mm -hmm. stuff, because it was six months with them rather than 10 weeks. Now, what kind of success did you see from that? Did you guys have a lot of success? Oh yeah. And it's cool now to see some of the guys are in the NFL. Oh, that's cool. And uh, like their first, second, third years in the NFL, and in 
in those two years of, of really pushing that group hard, <clears throat> you know, we had two guys to SC, three to UCLA, three to Washington, wow. five to Washington State. Wow. And it was fortunate that Orange County is kind of like hotbed for uh, for high school football. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, one of the we had nine D one guys from one school, so that that was helpful. What yeah. were you guys doing was that was different? Than, there. Yeah. What, what were you guys doing that was different than a lot of other other training systems? Or uh, I think how comprehensive it was was the biggest piece. It was incredibly competitive. Um, you know, the group was pretty much fifteen. The first the first year. I had to recruit a bit more and say like, all right, you guys should come do this, this special training group we're going to do. But then the next year, because the first year guys were so successful, I'm talking like on average and the the numbers are going to be a bit off, but it was in this ballpark, like plus 50, 60 pounds on all their benches, plus a hundred, 120 pounds in the squat, you know, minus. That's so rad. Yeah. Taking two to three tenths off their 40 yard dashes. And guys gaining 20 pounds of body weight in this six month span. And it's, you know, a, mirac- a miraculous time of life. When you're 18 years old, yeah. you know, hyper responder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously very talented genetically. Like that's why they're getting, yeah, yeah but not, and not to take anything from yeah. your programming. I mean, that's, yeah. that's exactly you what happens when that. you got the recipe for, and I, and I feel like 10 years ago, we are in such need for that in the, mm. especially that age group, like the, mm-hmm. the high school going to college. I didn't feel like there was a lot of people that were presenting a lot of really good information around that time. Yeah. So we, we just got to, I think the biggest thing was that it was so comprehensive and so competitive, mm-hmm. you know, that, that I planned out six months of training for each person, you know, by their position, by what kind of system they were going to run at their school, what kind of conditioning tests they had to, to be ready for. They worked with our, our PTs right off the bat to have sort of customized movement plans for them. They so got, did they you base it by like their pros. positions? Yep. Wow. Yeah, that's that's another level. You don't see that anywhere with strength conditioning coaches and programming. Yeah, and the the position stuff is like it seems like kind of a, a no brainer. Right. Right. I mean, you know, people are getting better at it now, but you see these these conditioning tests, and and this part is still bad for a lot of teams, even up in the NFL. These conditioning tests, and they're running one tens or three hundred yard shuttles, and it's like. Have you ever watched a football game? Like, <laughs> yeah. You got to watch the, this guy never moves more than five yards. Like, yeah, he's got to be the wildest animal possible in this five yard by five yard box over and over again. I like always thought that to 45 seconds. But. Yeah. Our linemen having to run all these hundred yard sprints with us yeah. and just dying. And it's like, come on, let's, let's make it a little more specific to what they're going to well, be doing. Let's, yeah. let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause I think that's really interesting for the listener to understand is like, how different the training looks like for, let's say, a lineman versus a wide receiver. And maybe you can give some examples of things that you just absolutely would not do with a wide receiver that you would do with a lineman and vice versa. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll talk some in kind of principle-based ideas about this and then can get some specifics for the actual positions. The first thing you got to do is is look at the athlete. So this is going to be for for any sport – uh, you know, the, the kind of sports science term would be a, a time motion analysis, but what we're looking at is how far do they move in each effort? So football is nice and straightforward because you say hike, then the whistle blows and then you get a little bit of rest where like basketball or soccer is kind of continuously ongoing. But for football, it's simple because, all right, these, these guys move zero to 10 yards Per play, these guys move, you know, five to twenty yards. These guys move five to thirty-five yards in one play. What kind of velocities are they going? What sort of resistance do they face along the way? Change of direction type of stuff. So once we can establish that and the time parameters, how long arrests do they have in between those efforts? Now we can start to design some really effective running programs for for these players, and that. You know, I think people think because I'm a power lifter, I'm just, just got to lift, lift, lift. The lifting, as long as you don't do something really dumb, there's a lot of lifting that's good enough for football players, basketball players. People want to try and reinvent the wheel with some of that stuff and get into to 
crazy movements and shit. Yeah, things that are maybe overly creative. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot of over creativity. I, I saw one yeah. the other day on YouTube with the rotating all weird on the stability ball and punching and shit like that. So, yeah. <laughs> like these, you guys could cre- you could create that with a landmine and you get the same fucking carryover, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. So assuming you're not getting overly creative in the weight room, a lot of those things can be good enough. But people will really mess up these running programs because the first year we did NFL combine prep and had like six guys get drafted and we we asking them, you know, these wide receivers and stuff. Well, what kind of speed training did you guys do at your school? Oh, uh, you know, we'd run uh, 16 110s or, you know, 20 40s or something like that. And it's like, no, no, not, not what kind of stupid conditioning did you do? What kind of speed training did you do? And with my background being track and field, I got to have exposure to a lot of really high level sprinters um, mm. and had a kind of special opportunity for my first three, my last year of college and first three years of juggernaut hosting the UK athletics, the British national track team for their warm weather training camp. They'd come out to California for about six weeks. And this is Dwayne Chambers it was 642 in the 60 uh, European record holder in the hundred meters. Christina Hurugu was gold medalist in the 400. And see these, see these, the most elite sprinters in the world work out. And when you see really elite sprinters do speed training, you know, do their speed work, you're like, well, these are the fucking laziest people ever. <laughs> they just did five seconds of work and then they sat around for five minutes. You know? Yeah. And, but that's what real speed training has to be. It has to be these incredibly high level efforts because mm. it's anaerobic. Yeah. And, and no matter how many, you can run as many four eights as you want. No amount of four eights make you run a four four. Right. You now, when you run a four six, you can't four eight four eight four eight four eight. When you're tired, doesn't make you run a four four. Mm-hmm. It makes you run a four eight. <laughs> you know, so so all these these football guys were getting conditioned and improperly conditioned rather than doing real speed training. Mm-hmm. So putting together the right kind of running programs for them with the right distances, the right rest intervals for it to be appropriate conditioning. That I think is is a big piece mm-hmm. and a big differentiation between between positions, because you can get into to general speed training stuff. You know, we're gonna start on the line and run in a straight line as fast as we can for this given distance. But then, as we would progress through the year, we would get into more like a special capacity, uh, you know, spe- special strength exercises, but they're more special conditioning exercises. Doing stuff like uh, maybe a wide receiver and defensive back or running back and linebacker, wide receivers and DBs, we'd put them in a 20 by 20 yard box and say, all right, six seconds, you tag him as many times as you can in six seconds. The linebackers and running backs, maybe they're in a 12 by 12 yard box. Same idea. So this guy's pursuing, this guy's changing direction. They're moving similarly to how they would in, in, in a football game positional start stuff like coming out of their stance, you know, moving laterally for a couple of yards, then straight ahead. All that stuff is important. Like you can't just do the the special exercise. Right. You have to mm-hmm. develop the straight line speed because so much of sport speed is, is actually happening at, at like less than 100% effort. So if you're, if right now you run a, a four or five, but most of the time during the game, you know, because you have to be aware of everything going on and, changing direction you're actually running more like 80 percent of that speed well now if we can run four four you can still run 80 percent or you could run 76 percent and still get past the guy and now as conditioning is easier and everything create more of that like speed reserve with traditional speed training and then the capacity mm. with the the more specific drills what's your thoughts on the the camps that say that in sports training that the ability to decelerate is more valuable than even the ability to accelerate. What do you think? Uh, I, I mean, that kind of prior, like prioritizing it like that, they're, they're all important. It's not, and it's not right. Like I know we, it's an overgeneralization yeah. statement for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean the, the ability to, to decelerate, to change direction, right. To have these like very slight, you know, shifts in, in body weight, the, the vision and understanding of how the play works. That's what allows someone to play very fast. You know, as we're, we're here in the, in the Bay area two San Francisco 49ers who are perfect examples of this one to the good side of things. Jerry Rice, Jerry Rice is not a fast goat guy in, in terms of 
running this blazing 40 yard dash. You know, he's like a four, six, four, seven kind of guy, Tim Brown, same, same way, Mm. but he has such a great understanding of what the defensive back was going to do, what he had to do. Anticipation of, Mm -hmm. of the, of everyone's movement that with this, you know, small fake and and everything, he could create this little bit of separation to look like he plays really fast Mm -hmm. to look like he was the fastest guy out there. Yeah, defense, uh, defensive back a few years ago named Taylor Mays, guy from USC. Freak of nature. 4'3", 240, 6'3", 245 pounds. Absolute freak of nature. We were talking to the former strength coach for the 49ers, and he talked about how slow Taylor Mays played. Because when he was in high school, he could go three steps out of position. Right, he could make up for his uh, sloppy play. And make up for it. So he's just lazy. And then... The in college, even at USC, he could go two steps out of position and come back and make the play. Mm. But that can happen in the NFL. Right, right. Yeah. So even though he ran a 4-3, his reactions and, and everything made it you know, more like he was Wow, how often four, do you five, think that four, happens six. in professional sports? Hmm. You think that's common? Yeah, oh, for sure. For sure a common thing. And some of it, I wonder if it's... You get these really fast... Like a, a common criticism among like the really fast players in the in the draft or do they just have straight line speed mm-hmm. if you had like a track guy come in but it's not inherent i think that being incredibly fast in a straight line means that you can't change direction you know that's not like something wired into their right. to their muscles that way we have a, a weightlifter we coach a guy named james townsend the most explosive person i've ever been around uh he played football at iowa and then for the bears for a couple of years even now, James is 33 or 34 years old. He's power cleaned, and I'm talking about barely a bend in his knees in the catch, 193 kilos, 425 pounds. He weighs 200 pounds. Whoa. Damn. He hang power snatch, 150 kilos, 330 pounds. He'd go out today and 43-inch vertical, 11-5 broad jump, all this stuff. So I'm like, man, you know, how is he so strong, so fast? How is he not explosive. the best player in the yeah. NFL ever? I asked him, you know, talked to him about when he was playing. He's like, you know, it just wasn't that smooth in and out of my breaks and all this stuff uh, when he's running routes. And then it got me thinking there's probably, there's a lot of people like James. He was the fastest, you know, he was the fastest player when he was 10 years old. When he was 15 years old and all the way through. So when he was a little kid, when you develop a lot of those change of direction abilities and coordination where he didn't have to, because they were like, well, just, just, you know, get the corner. Just go. Yeah, just get to the edge. <laughs> just, just go. <laughs> just run a streak and you just run past everyone. Mm-hmm. Where you get a guy like Russell Wilson, who's not like a super fast 40-yard dash guy. And I heard him telling this story about he would go to the mall when he was a little kid. And in like the crowded kind of center. Uh, center court. Area. Center court of the mall. He would just try and sprint through the crowd. Oh, and like cut. And, uh, and change direction through all the people. You know, just like a 10, 10 year old kid just sprint through the crowd, get to the other side as fast as he could. And him and his friends would like start on one side and race to the other side through the crowd without hitting anybody. Yeah. yeah. So he became, you know, great in, in juking people out and, mm-hmm. and changing direction. And so much of that stuff kind of goes back to even the, the pyramid of, of strength and, and development. You had to develop those qualities early. Mm-hmm. And it's like any, it's like learning a language. It's hard to learn a language when you're an adult. It's hard to improve coordination and athleticism when you're an adult compared to when you're a kid. Mm-hmm. It's it's not hard to communicate to most people about how important skill is in 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 sports, but sometimes when communicating to everyday people who just like to work out, how much just your gym strength is also a skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, telling people that there's a lot of skill involved in just being strong with your everyday workouts when you're deadlifting and bench pressing and squatting. Um, I mean, how, how much of it is skill versus how much of it is just your muscles? Uh, the, the better, the, num- the bigger numbers you lift, the more of it's skill. And yeah, you know, the skill of the one rep max for a powerlifter and weightlifter is going to be hugely important. Like for me, powerlifting, I squatted 970 pounds, bench 567 deadlifted 815 23 25 total at the time when I did I think it was the ninth highest of all time I've moved down that list a little bit but I have people people that I've coached lifters that I know 
who in so many of the exercises around the squat bench and deadlift were far superior to me, but they were not better at one rep maxes in those lifts Hmm. because they'd probably spent a lot of their training life doing more bodybuilding type of stuff and, Mm -hmm. and things that were just a little bit less specific. So they didn't have that skill, but we're talking about the top, you know, 0.1% of, of, uh, lifters in the world as you, as you move farther down that pyramid. Yeah. Just have, you know, being more muscular and stuff is going to allow them to, to lift more. Certainly, You had mentioned like the, the, the Bulgarian, that the, the gentleman you had brought up who trained in Bulgaria and was doing, you know, uh, specific lifts and he was doing them, you know, three times a day, like this mm-hmm. incredible amount of frequency. And, uh, you know, I guess in the early days of weightlifting, when the iron curtain was up, they were blowing us away because they, was it because they understood how important it was to practice and in, in this incredible amount of frequency of training versus our weightlifters? What was the big difference, um, uh, you know, between those two sides and why were they kicking our ass so much? Was it that, was it that they trained so often to practice the skill versus just, maxing out on the lifts. Yeah. So, you know, the, the sport of weightlifting is kind of interesting because it's gone through these sort of ebbs and flows of, of being really dominant and, and everyone now is like, Oh, U S you know, the U S sucks at weightlifting. We're getting a lot better now as, especially as other countries are having to clean up back fifties and sixties. We were very good as good or better than, than Russia. At some point they decided to put a ton of attention towards sport as a political tool and and really developed a level of sports science and infrastructure to their sports that the u.s does not have now that it probably never will have it was Mm state-sponsored yeah and that started you know as Ilya Ilyin is the lifter i was talking about he was for, for kazakhstan but yeah former soviet union the idea of him starting when he's six years old in like a sports school type of setting that's i think what set them apart more mm-hmm. than anything is that they had this incredible level of general preparation mm. so by the time they were you know 18 they were able to to just excel that much more and it's that kind of all just goes to a, a long term or short term development model and you know you see some of these young lifters in the US now CJ Cummings Harrison Morris incredible you know incredibly talented guys uh, Ian Wilson, uh, was one who, some, sometimes I, I get worried. I see those kind of guys cause I, I wonder, uh, is their coach more concerned with them being the best, you know, 15 year old in the world or being the best 25 year old in the world? Cause the two aren't, aren't the same. Someone might still be the best 15 year old in the world training in a bit more general sense, but just cause they're more talented, but doing the things that will make them immediately good are very specific training. You and know, you think they should, it would be better to avoid that if you want the long term. For sure. You want to, so if you, if you take a Ilya Ilyan approach and this goes for, for any sport, the, a lot of general training early and slowly over time, you know, when the athletes, depending on the sport, some like gymnastics, that's going to be a little bit earlier, but weightlifting, track and field, most team sports, when the athlete gets to be 18, 20 years old, maybe about 10 to 12 years in of training, where you're really going to shift to a lot more specialized training, you're going to get an athlete who improves. You take American sports model, six years old, you play club soccer, you play club soccer all year, Mm -hmm. every year. Soccer, 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 soccer practice, SPP, special physical preparation, sport practice all the time. No attention to GPP necessarily. Athlete improves like this, tapers off. Athlete with a lot of early GPP, later SPP, improve like this. That intersection point, 17, 18, 19, 20 so, years old. Like so in the beginning, matters. So the beginning GP, they're getting yeah. their asses kicked. Because, well, GPP yeah. means you're basically rotating sports, right? You're playing all general sports. General yeah, performance. That can, that can be it for sure, yeah. Okay, right. right. Okay. So, so they're getting their butts kicked. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right around seventeen, you're saying now they're as good as the kid who's been playing just soccer yep. his whole life. Mm. But then they start to surpass them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because now their their sports skill is close enough, while their physical skills are probably far superior. And then their sports skill is going to continue to improve, and they're better 
their greater physical skills will allow them to learn the sport to develop the sports skill to a greater degree. So based off of that recommendation, you would you then would probably recommend that most kids, you know, play as many sports as they can all the way through high school before uh, they start to really narrow it down to one. Yeah. So I've, I've written a couple articles about this and that the football player or the, the weightlifter, James, that I was talking about, he and I talk about this a, a ton because he has two daughters who are the most phenomenally talented children I've ever seen. Uh, his five-year-old daughter, Perseus, to do like there's a five year old girl I've seen her do seventy push ups. What? <laughs> like a set That's of awesome. a set of seventy push ups. Are you serious? I quit. Yeah. I'm out of here. I quit. And, uh, Forget it. Justin can't even do that right I now. Wear me out. <laughs> She's do, I'm tired thinking about it. Yeah, she's five years old. She could do like a twenty seven inch box jump. Damn. Yeah. And and this was really cause cause uh yeah, you know, he, he runs a gym. And she would just come with him, you know, play. Uh-huh. Yeah, she'd be sitting in the stroller watching him work out, and then she could walk when she was six months old. I mean, she's very remarkable, but she jumped on like a a forty five pound bumper when she was one. What? <laughs> what? And that doesn't make sense. So we've talked a lot of uh, with James about this kind of long term development ideas because like, don't screw this up. All right. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. seriously, it's a golden goose right here. <laughs> so, so like a simple model for it would be to break. Uh, you know, the life up into to multiple stages. So that first stage is is let's say from about five to nine, five to ten years like, old. I feel like gymnastics is where you would start. Yeah, yeah, gymnastics. So even even before that five year old part of things, swimming is great because they probably swim before they can walk because the buoyancy is going to allow them to move their body through mm. through the water because they don't have to have as much strength. Uh. So swimming is is sort of the the base, and then you know whatever kind of like mommy and me tumbling gymnastics class they can do great. But we'll we'll start at say five five years old. So stage one would be five to nine, five to ten. You know biological age is a decent indicator, but kids going to develop at quite different rates. That's a time where, and it doesn't have to be competitive sport, but activities related to gymnastics and track and field all the time, you know, mm-hmm. do that all year, play games, you know, running, tumbling, yeah, yeah. jumping, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Play AYSO soccer, basketball, mm-hmm. whatever. Do, mm-hmm. Yeah. Do stuff all the time. Uh, like I, I started playing organized sports when I was five years old, soccer and basketball. So essentially you'd want to, you'd want to have one sport per season and then the gymnastics type of stuff to be omnipresent. And when you're a little kid, you know, and this this isn't the case for some people who get really heavily involved in club sports. They start practicing just that sport three to four times a week with tournament on yeah. the on the weekend when they're six years old. I'd say if you practice, if you had two sport practices during the week and then a game on the weekend, different sport every season for phase one. Then they become ten. And maybe 10 to 13 years old. So, you know, early adolescence to the start of high school. Then they're going to go to three organized sports seasons with one season dedicated purely to GPP, you know. And I, how this actually gets put into practice, you could do it wrong and you could be like, all right, well, now it's 10 year old, it's your GPP season. You know, it's not going to be like that. It's got to be more fun and, and yeah. loose than yeah. that. But the concept would be three organized sports seasons and one season just for training, you know, training for a 10, 11 year old. So that training season is going to be gymnastics, calisthenics, probably introduce some resistance training at that point. And then the other three seasons are for the sport, but three different sports. And now maybe you go to practicing three to four times a week with a game on the weekend, the occasional tournament, but still some some other GPP stuff throughout the year all the time. Cause that's how the, the, you know, a 11 year old soccer practice shouldn't just be two hours of, of soccer strategy. It needs to be teaching them how to run, you know, doing push ups and sit ups and, and air squats and all that kind of stuff, just making them better athletes and coordination drills and everything. So that'd be phase two, phase three, high school, you go to two competitive sports and two seasons of GPP. So the competitive sport is going to have to be pretty much focused on just that sport with limited GPP 
in it. So let's say you play football in the fall, do track in the spring. You're just doing that sport. You practice five, you know, five times a week. You have a game every week during that season. Then you have two seasons for general training. And then finally, the the person gets to college and they play one sport and they go into a regular sort of annual plan with times of more GPP, less GPP, more SPP, less SPP. Hmm. But that's like kind of a, a just simple, simple strategy. No, Explain great- uh, Bo Jackson. <laughs> uh, let's get Bo Jackson's parents on here. And that explains <laughs> Bo Jackson. <laughs> you know, you, you look a lot of, uh, at a lot of these athletes who grow up in rural uh, rural areas and a lot of uh, like strength athletes, people like uh, John Cole, Don Reinhout, guys who who were competing in the seventies and still had records standing into the two thousands in in powerlifting into the twenty teens even. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, training that's gotten better. Like training's supposed to have gotten better. You know, genetics are supposed to have advanced nutrition. You know, drugs, all this stuff, like it shouldn't even be close. I think one really big thing that people, you know, growing up in the 40s and 50s or growing up in rural areas have is better GPP because of a more active lifestyle, a more general, uh, you know, a more general preparatory base. Whether that means you're doing uh, manual labor, working exactly. on a farm. All right. Yeah, you're doing manual labor. There's no, you don't have TV, you don't have video games. So you're just outside playing with your friends all the time. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I, and I'm only 30, I'm 32, but uh, I, I was very fortunate in the way, yeah, you know, that my parents encouraged me to, to, to do all these different sports. But the school I went to, went to a private, private school, we had 24, boys in my graduating class so i went kindergarten through eighth grade with almost all the same people of those 24 boys eight of us went uh to Divi- on division one scholar- college scholarships for volleyball track water polo soccer all these different sports and it was it was not like it was some athlete magnet school it was just a kind of unique blend of of kids we had the most competitive recess and lunch games all the time <laughs> all right. from kindergarten through yeah, maybe in eighth grade. That's when we were finally like, OK, I guess we don't want to play like all out as hard as we can basketball for the next 45 minutes and go to our next class sweaty as hell because like now we care about girls. But right. up until that <laughs> point, it was like. We'd be oh, coming, game on. Yeah, like coming back yeah. into class, like, you know, skin, knees, like whatever just drenched in sweat because we played hard all the time. Different, you know, that. It'd be a, a month we'd play basketball and then we played soccer and then there's handball and four square and whatever it was, we had this great general preparation. So a lot of people like Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker, mm-hmm. uh, if you've seen one of my favorite 30 for 30s, uh, the best that never was, Marcus oh, Dupree. Yes. yes. You know, they, they talk about him lifting weights on the broomstick and he's loading the bricks on there and then they play all these pickup football games and pickup basketball games and and just Herschel Walker sees a train going down the tracks and he's trying to race the train for as long as he can. That's just an incredible level of preparation mm. that if someone is in this formalized soccer practice, soccer practice, soccer practice, or travel baseball and then winter travel ball and then spring travel mm-hmm. ball, and all they do is is play baseball, they're never going to be able to match that level of GPP because if a kid has done that, whether it's manual labor or whatever, from when they're six – to their 16 and the other kid from six to 16 did club sports, you know, with no, with whatever GPP component is involved in that, but nothing outside of it. Mm-hmm. How, when the, both of those kids are 16 years old, this guy has been doing two to four hours a day of manual labor and play. And this kid's been, been doing two hours a day, of soccer practice how's the how's the soccer practice kid ever going to catch up 10 years of gpp work that the other kid has on well it's even more than that because there there are formidable years in brain development where if you take a child and you have them learn you know three different languages before the age of 10 they'll speak all three of them without an accent Uh uh-huh you could take an adult and have them learn. I mean, you could teach me Spanish, Chinese, and Russian, and I can learn them, and I'll be able to speak them. 
but I'll always have an American accent. Yeah, I'll yeah. always have an English accent because I've missed those those formidable years of brain development where yeah. the brain, it's got a certain amount of plasticity. Exactly. But there's a, a, a certain amount of development that becomes solidified and the plasticity of a child's brain is insane. And so they just learn how to become these, you know, uh, just this, this, they develop this incredible intelligence uh, through body awareness because yeah. they're doing all kinds of different things. You just can't get that later on. Mm -hmm. But there's another component too that I was going to ask you about is, I bet you the injury rates are probably higher with the kids that just do the same shit all the time. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's that's one of the biggest problems of early specialization uh, in youth athletics is, you know, burnout from a psychological standpoint, but also repetitive use injuries from, you know, kind of a lack of uh, a broad enough preparedness base. But to that idea of like neural plasticity, that's huge, uh, particularly in the most explosive of sports. Uh, so 100 meters uh, being you know, the main example, the highest velocity mm -hmm. that people are moving in any sport. If in that formative time, kind of the, the stage one and stage two or phase one and phase two that I talked about, so about six to 12 years old, if they're not doing like very fast movements in that or they their youth soccer coach decides that they're going to you know do long distance running and run a lot of gassers, during that time, that kid will never be able to to run, you know, that that last the difference between ten ones and and nine nines in the hundred meters, they'll never be able to mm -hmm. to overcome that wow. that time of of like lactic based work. And it, it you know, sometimes uh in Orange County we have huge club sports. So anytime I'm I'm driving and drive past the soccer field, like there's some kind of club soccer practice going on. I see the kids running, running gassers or just like these long jogs or something. And I'm just like, he's taking, he's taking right. the fast twitch out of them. Right, now. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 right. There's like one sprinter in there. You're killing, you're yeah, killing yeah, that yeah. one sprinter in there one day. Yeah. And the, uh, you guys ever read the book, uh, the sports gene by David Epstein? No, no. Oh, I've been meaning I've, to. I've seen, yeah. Yeah, very, good, very, very interesting. And he talks about in, uh, I think it's the Netherlands for soccer. Small, small country, but very successful uh, soccer program. But they had this incredibly high incidence of injuries with their fastest athletes. And it's because sort of what they built their their model on was really high volume training. And those kind of athletes can't tolerate it, mm. can't tolerate that because their outputs are too high. So they'd have like their fastest athletes always out because of the chronic hamstring mm -hmm. problems and stuff. And it's kind of to that same effect is just training the not organized the right way for them at the right times, particularly. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, the other, the other aspect of it, even besides looking at it and saying, I want my kid to be this in incredible athlete is you want them to be as, as healthy um, and mobile as possible. Mm -hmm. I, I learned, I mean, this hit me real hard when we had a, a, a movement specialist as a friend of ours, talk to us about the, uh, the foot and just how complex the muscles and the movement of the foot are and how we've completely ruined our feet because we've, we wear shoes since the time we can walk. Mm -hmm. And I remember going online and looking at the feet of uh, modern hunter gatherers and how different their feet looked. I mean, their, their toes were all spread out and muscular. And, and I looked at my feet and I'm like, there's no amount of training I could do now yeah. that will ever make my feet like, because they've been doing it since they were children. I've missed those formidable years of that kind of development. So it's just how important. So when you look at like school programs and stuff now that if they're taking out activity and children now are stuck on electronics and yeah. seem to be encouraged to do so. Um, well, the liability, like uh, Marissa's got two kids, a 14 year old daughter and a 12 year old son and a 12 year old son. Like if he runs across the playground, like they're not allowed to run. Yeah. Like at school what? outside of like in PE type of stuff because of just liability. Oh like, my so, god! This is here in California. Yeah. Oh what? my god! Oh, they yeah. they, oh like man. a yard duty's out there blowing a whistle yeah. if you're running. Wow. Yeah. But, wow. But what what's wrong with that is they're oh, looking so at that's, that's upsetting. Well, yeah, they're looking at it like you know, okay, it's dangerous. Kids can fall down and get hurt. Of yes, course. Yes, course. risk goes up when you run, but the but they don't understand that they're they're taking away the development uh, yeah. of of that child and not realizing that their ability to move and learn how to move doesn't just affect their body mm -hmm. it also affects their brain yeah because that's where it all comes from it's not just coming from it's not just the muscles and bones mm -hmm. it's also brain development so it's uh it's it's 
<laughs> oh, it's pretty crazy. It's shocking. Yeah. I had yeah. no idea that was happening. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's pretty pretty awful. Wow. So when you're training younger athletes, is th- is that one of the strategies to prevent injuries to make them as general as possible? Yeah, yeah, very general preparation. Like I said, gymnastics based drills, that's gonna be great. You know, if parents with, with young kids, like get your kid into gymnastics right away. They they might, you know, they're probably never gonna grow up and be Sean Johnson or or you know, Simone Biles or whatever, but just that coordination that they develop there, dance type of stuff. Uh, was listening to this thing on uh, Lomachenko, the boxer, and he was a a ballerino, which mm. is the male version of a ballerina. Mm-hmm. I just never. Actually I don't heard. know that you did. Yeah. You would say that. I know they're all yeah. ballerinas. Yeah. I'd never heard. I'd never heard that either. I understand why, because it's a goofy sounding word it sounds yeah. like some really italian yeah guy. ballerino yeah, yeah tony ballerino yeah <laughs> but, uh, but he don't was don't let a, him date your daughter <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he was a ballerino from like a high level in russia from like five to 15 and well no wonder he's got the most phenomenal mm-hmm. footwork and, and this really unique boxing style from from all of that general preparation um but yeah so that stuff just very very and let them have fun like encourage them to to try all these different stuff and have fun doing it. So you mentioned a little bit like, so if you're driving by and you're watching all these kids get overly conditioned and uh, some of these things that you see really irritate you, what are some other things uh, within strength and conditioning world and coaches that you see, uh, you know, that really irritate you as far as like what they're teaching their, uh, you know, their athletes? Uh, You know, if, if there was one thing that, that, what really grinds my gears yeah. um, are people and, and social media and everything has, has made this way too prevalent is that anyone can be an expert. This is the most, the most frustrating mm-hmm. thing to me that the, the barrier of entry to expertise is none. Yeah. Non, non-existent. Uh, you it's know, how many followers you have. Exactly. It's, and everyone's got a smartphone, so they're all ready to film themselves doing doing their thing, but they have no credential behind it. So, you know, we talk about expertise in, in, uh, you know, strength or powerlifting coaches, weightlifting coaches as really being able to be measured by, by three factors. And you want to have at least two of the three and the people you're listening to, you want to look and make sure that they have at least two of these three things and three out of three, even better that they've done it themselves. If they've done it at a very high level, that can be good, but some people are just meant to be strong and and that's how they were born. They could have done anything to get there. But it does give a, a bit of unique perspective. If you are a really high-level competitor, I think that there are unique insights you can have to other mm-hmm. high-level competitors. 100%, 100%. Maybe more psychological even than, uh, you know, than the real organization of training. Two, have you coached people very successfully? That's a big one, I mm-hmm. think. And three, what is your education in this formal informal my degree is in history you know but but i've informally educated myself about this stuff if if there's so many people out there listening people with with maybe one out of three of those things right maybe. very often zero out of three of those things and i and i see some people you know being touted as these these guru level coaches and these incredible sources of knowledge you know while while Max, my, my, you know, our weightlifting coach at Juggernaut, he and I are at, you know, IPF Worlds coaching powerlifters or IWF Worlds coaching weightlifters or the U.S. Open for powerlifting and big dogs, all these, the biggest competitions in the world for these sports. And we look around and we're like, well, where the fuck are these, uh, these people that, you know, where, where are these coaches? <laughs> the ones that everyone that they got so many followers, like they're not here because they don't actually do it. Mm-hmm. So that that's the most frustrating thing to me. Um, well, I think part of the problem, or maybe part of the challenge, we see this in our space all the time, um, is that the the people who are getting all the the views and attention, they're just good at looking good and communicating. And a lot of times, the people who have the great information, the smart people, are boring, yeah. and they're not getting the same kind of attention. So it's like, do you look at that and say, okay? That guy's an idiot, but he's doing something right because he's getting all the views. What can I learn from that so people oh, can hear sure. me? Yeah. So the, the the distinction I make there is that there's internet coaches and there's coaches who put stuff on the internet. 
the latter I think is a much better thing. You know, mm-hmm. real coaches who then want to share share their mm-hmm. their information rather than people who just talk about it. You know, and can make a great YouTube video. But you can have all the best information in the world, and this is really our our goal at Juggernaut is we're we're coaches who put stuff on the internet. Mm-hmm. But if we can't figure out how to share that information effectively with as many people as possible, what's the point? Mm-hmm. So, you know, everyone's got kind of a a different place that they might draw their their line with with some of that stuff on like how clickbaity or whatever it's going to get. But if a clickbait type of title gets more people to watch or read really useful information, well, that's a that's a great thing. So, you know, for us, the last real two, maybe going on three years, uh, as we've tried to get more professional in our in our video and and presentation for everything. Yeah, I mean, we, we got to learn learn from those people and, and be able to more effectively share the information. Well, that was a challenge that we had. I remember when we first started was was that was, OK, how do we get this attention and, and not feel like we have to do all this gimmicky type yeah. shit? And, you know, and, and some people gave us some heat because we, you know, when that's unfortunately how like the YouTube algorithm works, you know, mm-hmm. is if you got a good thumbnail, you've got a good title. A lot of people click and view on it and comment it right away. It pops up and views on more pages. You're more likely to get found. And the thing that I would always challenge people that, you know, would give us a hard time for that is just like, listen, did you did you not find the information incredibly valuable? Exactly. Like I didn't clickbait you and then try and sell you some bullshit. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> I clickbaited you to get you to hear so you could hear a really good message. And yeah. if, if you feel that the message wasn't good, then by all means, speak up. But, you know, if you I think if you're presenting good, good, a good message, I think that you guys sometimes have to kind of play you know, some of the tactics and the game that some of these people are doing on the, it's just to get noticed, you know, get oh, out there. Sure. So, and I think people like yourself, I think will will sustain much longer business wise. Like I think we're going through a phase right now. This, yeah. you know, you've been around for a long time. You've been in the business for a long time like us. Uh, and I feel like we're all kind of in this Instagram, YouTube world right now that's still in its infancy. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the cream will rise to the top. You know, the, the thing that that um, I would like to see is because when you look at general health and fitness, a lot of the information is coming from people who look a certain way. Mm-hmm. I would like to see more coaches who understand training, really know training and who have experience training people and working with people. I'd like to see them be able to get more popular because they're the ones that are actually giving the good information. The oh, that's look, what motivated what we're doing here. Yeah, the look good people are given just terrible. And we're just talking about general fitness stuff. And I oh, yeah. look at this and it's just, ah. Oh. I mean, I've always taken a lot of pride in knowing that I have this certain level of, of popularity and like that as a ratio to like how not funny I am on videos and how <laughs> and how fat I, I am. I was like, this is the most impressive ratio. I'm the least funny and fattest person to be this popular. <laughs> so I always that means you're, you're winning, dude. That, that means you're yeah. presenting good yeah. shit. Yeah. You know? That's winning. what that means. Yeah. I was like they they're they're obviously here for my for my mind. Yeah. You know? yeah. They're not using yeah. me for my body. Yeah. Uh but yeah that 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 is a tough a tough thing but something I've always kind of kept in mind that you know, our, our number one goal is to, pr- to provide people the most useful information to help them reach their goals. And that might not always be packaged in the slickest or sexiest way or whatever, but it's never going to go out of style. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so some people might come in a year, two years, five year run and they're big and then they're gone. Right. And, but, I, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years. I plan on, on doing it for as many more as I can. I've had four jobs in my whole life. Delivered newspapers when I was like 11. Worked at a restaurant, coached high school football, and I did juggernaut. And I'm only going to have four jobs. This is what I'll do for the rest of my life. That's awesome. That's cool. Man. Let's talk about the difference because you had mentioned the three things, the three criteria markers that you should look at. And one of those, uh, which I fully agree with, is having actually coached uh, or worked with many people. Um, and for me, that's the difference between um, knowledge uh, and wisdom. Um, you know, in in the space of just you know training everyday people, and we would we I would see these people who would have these advanced degrees in training, mm-hmm. or who themselves were amazing athletes, but had never worked with lots and lots of everyday people, and so they just didn't know how to apply it. They didn't have any wisdom. I mean, how important is that? Is is wisdom versus knowledge, and you know what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, of those three factors, the 
actually having coached and done it effectively and successfully is the, is the most significant one. This is very unlikely that someone has just coached really well without having sure one of, if not both of the other parts, unless they're just like a great recruiter or incredibly lucky. Um, I started coaching high school football when I was 19 years old. And if I look back at the programs and stuff that I wrote for, for our team in the off season, then compared to what we, you know, what I stuff I write now, that program was so needlessly complex Mm. and, and, it's so funny where you're yeah, going. So I love it's that. funny where you're going right now yeah. because this is something that we say on the show all the time yeah. of how we used to train clients. I mean, the in the early days, I mean, we've all mm-hmm. been doing this for between 16, 20 years. And back when I started, uh, it was, you know, how much could I throw at the client yeah. to confuse them and just do all this stuff? And, and now when I look at the way we program, I mean, it's your core lifts. It's the yeah. big four core. And then it's like a few things built on that. And in fact, if we ever get a return, we rarely have somebody return anything that we, any of our programs. But if we do, it's normally somebody who has not listened to the show. They just bought it because someone told them and then they return it going, these are all movements. All I kn- fancy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know these exercises. I thought I was going to get something totally different. Well, that's because you <laughs> fucking should be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, the last 13 years of, of coaching people from, you know, youth athletes to professional athletes. Uh, there's just so, so much understanding that I gained of why, what I was doing then was less than ideal. And even to go back farther than that, I I've essentially written my own training with the exception of about a year and a half in college. And then about 10 months working with uh, a powerlifting coach named Josh Bryant. I've written my own training since I was 14 years old. So just the, you know, I was my first guinea pig, and then the guys on our high school team who, like, they really wanted to try and train hard, like, all right, then I started writing their their programs and stuff too. And it, it's th- that trial and error and and the psychology of working with people. That's and, a big one. Yeah. The, there's no way to, to learn how to do it without mm-hmm. doing it. And I see that you constantly revisit it. And you, yeah. you look back and, and, and see, uh, okay, where are those things that I could improve upon? And I think that that's, you know, that's a great practice and something that's admirable. I, I don't see – a lot of times I'll see coaches and programs that are popular out there that will just – I mean, that's it. That That's where uh, – and, and they'll defend it by all means necessary and, and won't be real critical of it. So uh, on on Wednesday when I did this this – the coaching education thing for Mamba Sports Academy. It came about because my friend, who's the the head of physical preparation there, he has his his assistants every week. They they rotate doing like a continuing education thing, and they they make a presentation. So he tells me he's like, "Oh, our our guy today is presenting about the juggernaut method," and I was like, "Oh, that's cool." And I was uh, I was like, "Well, maybe I'll, I'll show up and like surprise him and mm-hmm. walk in as he's about to start uh, start presenting." But, but I see the presentation, it's like, you know, this is stuff I wrote six or seven years ago. Like, I've learned, like, a ton of stuff since then. I was like, how about you guys, instead of this, you know, seven-year-old book, here's things that I'm doing now. You know, not that the stuff was wrong then. It's just not as right as right. it could have been. We've built on it. Are, yeah. are you seeing a – because I, I, I look at, you know, fitness more from a general – standpoint and i was a big fan of uh you know the bodybuilding magazines and stuff like that growing up and it, there seemed to be a period of time where there wasn't that much focus on training and how important training was how important uh your programming was it, it for it was at first and then it wasn't po- it was like everybody worked out the same it was all about the supplements and steroids you took and everybody worked out followed the same routine and now it feels like people are starting to get back into programming and how important that is are, are we seeing that generally as well, where now everybody's really starting to pay attention to, uh, you know, programming and, and how big of a difference that makes versus all the other stuff? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's if it's in place of all the other stuff, but it it's it's definitely, you know, people are really looking at the details there. And it feels more now than ever. Yeah, what it feels like. 
Yeah, and, and for a lot of people, it's probably to a fault that they're <clears throat> they're overanalyzing every just little. You know, they can right. put the tendo or, or or to measure bar velocity and their HRV and every single one of these data pieces they can get, but they don't know what to do with with mm-hmm. the data. So you know, that's kind of always pendulum swinging swinging back and forth, and it's probably to an overanalyzing in a lot of uh, parts right now. And and you know, I'm, I've probably contributed to that at least in the powerlifting world because well you know we're trying to do it the best we can mm-hmm. so we present a lot of information about that but the the program side of things has always been what's most interesting to me I mean, even when I, when I was 14 15 years old you know and, and google was much more limited than in the early 2000s and in information that you could get access to just didn't exist nearly to the point it did today but i was trying to find all of it and and I go back and still have some of these like binders full of mm. of the training that I would do then because it was sprinting and jumping and throwing and lifting and all this stuff. And some of it was great and some of it was stupid, but I was I was all trying to put it together in, in the right way. And I think for me throughout my own powerlifting career, like, yeah, I had good genetics to lift a lot of weight, but not better than a lot of the other people out there. But I lifted more weight because I did a more effective well-designed program. That's why I had these huge carryovers from training to competition and, and to be able to help athletes do that now, you know, is, that's always like, that's the fun part of the puzzle for me is, is how we're going to get the most out of this one day that matters. Mm-hmm. And about, I started training jiu-jitsu about a year ago. So now I'm training for jiu-jitsu tournaments and it's all right, well, how do I put the, the jiu-jitsu training together with the lifting and you know you brought up the examples of uh, of kids who were so genetically gifted at speed that they'd never picked up the intricacies of the technique mm-hmm. are you having issues like that with jiu-jitsu because you're such a big strong dude are you finding it hard to like scale down your strength and focus because i mean i i rolled i did jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. for about six years and i used to have to do that and i'm not i'm like half your size and i remember i used to have to scale it back because otherwise I would get away with a lot of strength. Are you finding like I got to chill and otherwise you're just going <laughs> to. Yeah. So destroy as, as soon as I started, everyone was like, you know, roll like you're like you have no strength, you know, try to not yeah. use any of your strength. And I, I took that to heart right off the bat. So I try and be as technical as possible and not use a lot of strength. But it's when it's higher belt guys and or, you know, preparing for a tournament like, OK, I got to use the gifts. Use that what I, you have. Use the gifts that I have. But. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying to learn, you know, I'll try and if, if we're drilling some Barambolo stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to try it the best I can. It's so it's, I don't think it's as mentally limited as it is just physical flexibility and mobility for some of the positions, uh, limiting me on, on some of the technique stuff. But actually my first exposure to jiu-jitsu, it was one of the first groups that we actually trained a lot of athletes in when I opened Juggernaut in 2009. Uh, I was fortunate enough to connect with an athlete named Fabio Vilela and uh, this guy is 6'7", 250, Brazilian dude. And we we're kind of just cold calling people when we opened up and he ran a jiu-jitsu school. And I was like, hey, can I come tell you about what we do? And went in, talked to him. And I was like, how about you come in on Monday and and I'll I'll take you through a session. If you like it, you know, you can tell your students about it. He did that. You know, from from him and uh, training uh, at one point, probably had like 15 black belts, pretty much all Gracie Baja guys, the professors to like every school in Orange County at the time. They would all train together at Gracie Baja headquarters where I train now. And they would come and do strength and conditioning with me after guys like Kamalu Bahao, seven time world champion, um, Philippe Pena, who's considered like the best jiu jitsu athlete in the world mm-hmm. now. I uh, trained him when he was like, before he won purple belt worlds and then before brown belt worlds. And, and they'd always be like, Oh, Shad, like you got the train, man. Like you're going <laughs> to, you're, you're going to smash everybody. <laughs> and like, Oh yeah, you know, that'd be fun. But like, I can't hurt my elbow or something. I got to lift and, and do these. So I just got to point you know, late uh, 2017. I was like, Oh, powerlifting. I'd, I've done that. Same shit over and over every day. Dude, like, my first coach, trained uh, and competed as a strongman at oh, yeah. uh, Garth Taylor and he was uh he was one of the first Americans if not the first American to medal in the mundials but uh, he moved and he was a big dude yeah, yeah. but he moved like a small guy and let yeah. me tell you when you do jiu jitsu 
it's one thing to go against someone who's good. It's another thing to go against someone who's fucking massive and strong and good. It's very, it's yeah. very humbling. It's a very humbling experience. So it's yeah. going to be fun. Yeah. I mean, the whole sport has just been, it's, uh, I've really enjoyed it now for uh, 15 months or so. It's a blast. It's just a new challenge every day. And, uh, and I, you know, we're 10, 10 weeks out from Pan Ams or something. So, you know, I'm, I'm on my computer and I was like, all right, we're going to do this on this day, this on this day. And how am I going to fit it all, fit it all in? And that's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Now, uh, back to powerlifting has powerlifting. Are they enjoying a, uh, a, a spurt and growth and popularity right now? Because Mm. I remember for a second there, uh, powerlifting seemed to get a little crazy with all the equipment that they were using, the the suits and the bench shirts and stuff like that. And it seems like now, you're seeing a lot more lifters go out there raw and that seems to have made it more popular. Is my speculation correct? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I started powerlifting end of 2010 and I'd never been to a powerlifting meet before. I remember when I was going to to buy my first singlet that I was, I was on elite FTS and I was looking at these, I was looking at the page and I was like, why is this one $250 and this one's $50? I said, I should get that $250 one. It must be better. Yeah, but it was a squat suit, not a not a single hit, and I just did, I didn't know the difference. And uh, I, I was probably if there were thirty lifters at the meet I did, there was ten raw and twenty equipped lifters there. And I'd done a couple meets competing raw against or like at big multiply powerlifting meets in early 2011. So all these guys from West Side and Big Iron and all this stuff, they're there, and I'm watching it just like how the fuck would anyone do this? Like, this is really weird to me. Like besides that, the, the equipment is just, I just don't understand why someone would want to do it. But also a lot of that lifting was done to a really poor standard of uh, with very lax judging, letting mm-hmm. stuff pass. And I think as people, as YouTube and, and everything started to become more prevalent and people could see like, okay, well they said that they have this many people that squat 1100 pounds, but what, they just did there was not a squat they uh it it sort of shifted the tide there to to raw and then with crossfit coming in just so many more people knew what squat bench and deadlift were so that you know exponentially increased the the numbers the first meet i ever did in october 2010 was the first meet that the uspa had ever held and they're probably the second biggest federation in the u.s 30 lifters in a high school gym you could drive two hours, uh, you know, from my house in Orange County, a two hour radius every weekend, the USPA would be having a meet with 60, 90, 120 lifters. Mm, wow. And back in 2010, you're at, you're at the meet. You could tell everyone there was a power lifter. You could tell by looking at them that mm-hmm. they were a power lifter. Now you go and there's from 15 year old kids to, you know, 75 year old. Yeah, it's becoming a thing now. Yeah. Grandmas and mm-hmm. stuff. And, you know, people instead of playing in in their you know Tuesday night softball league or you know men men's league basketball or whatever, like now they do powerlifting, and uh, it's been really cool to see to see that growth. The level of lifting is unbelievable. Uh, I squatted nine oh five in two thousand eleven. There was pretty much only two Americans. I was one of two Americans uh, actively competing who had done that raw. Now there's like I don't know thirty. 40, 50 wow. Wow. numbers that that were great for 275s and 308s and stuff hmm. in 2012 now are being done by 198s and 220s. The level of female lifting is even more amazing than that. Uh, Marissa first set the IPF world record in the deadlift. She pulled 385 at 114 wow, at the 2016 Arnold. That was the IPF world record. Now, just in USAPL IPF, there's probably eight or nine girls in our weight class who can go over that. Wow. wow. And I love uh, one of the things yeah, I love about really powerlifting cool. is uh, what always drew me to it was it was performance based. Um, but besides that, I like it because uh, it, it's a great counter to some of the negatives that uh, people can get from fitness, which is the, the focus on so much on the aesthetic. And especially with women that they, uh, to the detriment of their health, because they're just focused on how they look Mm -hmm. and they start to cut their calories and they start to eat real little and overwork their bodies. 
where you can take someone like that who maybe has some food issues or issues with you know their 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 self image, get them to compete in a performance based sport like powerlifting where you got to feed yourself and you're measuring your progress not because you've lost ten pounds on the scale mm. but rather because you're lifting more weight um, and you can get extreme in any sport but I always found it to be a great healthy alternative or, or at least something that I think is it's a good thing that's getting popular uh, I guess is what I want to say yeah. Uh- there is a lot of stuff like that, that that exists for sure. And even I think within weight class controlled sports, powerlifting, weightlifting, there's people who probably still, you know, struggle with some of those issues trying to hold their sure. hold their weight down uh, for a weight class or who go to the other side of it and they're like, well, fuck it. It doesn't matter at all how much I weigh now, just how much <laughs> I lift. Uh, I don't know if I, if I did that, but you know, I was like three, 375 uh, lifting my best, the 370, 375, I'm like 315 now but uh so there's there's definitely people who are just like it doesn't matter i'm just gonna sure. lift as much as i can and that's not healthy either but uh yeah it's 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 a great it's it's a cool sport because anyone anyone can do it and uh yeah you, you do get that that focus on performance and it seems so many girls who do bikini or physique or something you know they they see their their instagram fitspo and that gets them to to do their first, mm-hmm. you know, bikini competition. It's like, well, that person's probably going to do a powerlifting meet within a year, you know, because they're gonna be like, oh, fuck this dieting. This is <laughs> terrible. <laughs> like, uh, I appreciate that. Well, too. well, not only that, but that I think part of the the increase, too, is that, you know, I'm, and I remember watching this and we talked about this on the show before, you know, 15 years ago, I'd come in the gym and there'd be dust on the squat rack Mm -hmm. like nobody was doing it and we've we've talked about i think how what crossfit did so great for just the general fitness space is they've reintroduced like you said those those exercises now everybody knows what bench squat deadlift really is i mean it was such a foreign foreign movements unless you were in the strength type of world so i really think that just that reintroduction of that and then people finding out how important those lifts are. I mean, those of us that have been in this for a long time know that, but the general population, I don't think realized how important those lifts are for so many other than besides just strength and how you look, but also just general health. I mean, you're talking about some of the most important lifts. And then, then and I think the we've talked about this also, the programming in the strength world has been superior to the bodybuilding world and, and everywhere else for a very long time. I mean, I, I feel like yeah, yeah. that was the only place there was real programming for a long time. Yeah. And I think, you know, track and field is always the sport that I, that I look at. That's the most cutting edge in terms of, of program design because the, the highest levels of human performance and mm-hmm. uh, with weightlifting just slightly below that. And both of those can kind of trickle down, to powerlifting, to, to other strength and conditioning. And then those ideas probably eventually trickle down to general population stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's certainly when every pound or every kilo matters, it's objective. Yeah. The, the programming has to be that much sharper. I really like what you guys are doing. I don't know how long you've been doing this on the YouTube channel. I'm, I'm curious to what made you start doing this, but you guys are, I don't, are those other coaches for you that are doing the logs, the workout logs? Uh, yeah. So, so that one, that you're talking about specifically is a guy named Garrett Blevins. Yeah. So Garrett is a co-creator with me. We have Juggernaut AI coaching. Uh, it's an expert system. It is artificial intelligence expert system. It's not machine learning stuff that would be like an unethical thing to actually try and use machine learning on humans. Oh, that's because, such a, it's a good topic right there. Yeah. So we, we have a buddy who actually has created an app, and that was yeah. one of the things that you know, we try to tell him he's dumped a ton of money and invested in the last few years doing it. And it's like, y- you can't really create a complete AI for the human. I mean, because there's so many variables yeah. that could be changed. Yeah, it has to to at least begin with known parameters that, that myself, the expert in our expert system, has given to it. Right. Mm-hmm. Because if it, it's not, it can't just have a, a billion trials of things on on a you know a piece of data it, mm-hmm. a person has to do this stuff mm-hmm. and if the machine thinks like well let's try ten, this 10 it's were, not gonna 10, have the intuition yeah 10 was good so 20 must be better and let's just keep going and then the person dies but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so we we create this expert system ai uh coaching it's got 
Uh, it'll be in a mobile app in, in March. Uh, right now it's all for powerlifting, but we'll also have it for uh, weightlifting and then super total powerlifting, weightlifting combination. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Garrett's just kind of, you know, he's running it himself and, and showcasing how it works. Uh, okay, that's what that is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think a lot of people thought, oh, there's using AI. That's just like a, a gimmick for marketing. Like, no, it is a AI expert, uh, expert system. Uh, artificial intelligence, like we talked to you know, computer science professors and they're like, yes, this is artificial intelligence. It's got four quadrillion permutations of the original inputs, four quadrillion permutations to the program. It's taking into account you know, athletes, gender, height, weight, experience, strength in all the lifts, diet, sleep, outside training, stress, uh, different technique considerations, to design a totally custom program, like as close to what I would write for them. Right. Mm. But it does it, you know, in, do you have any sensors yeah. or anything involved with that process or how does it, it get all that outside stress data? No, I, that stuff's all just uh, based on athlete feedback. Yeah, perceived, oh, right? Perceived, yeah. I gotcha. You know, uh, as we get into the mobile app and, and further down other versions of it, I'd love to be able to do some like HRV uh-huh. integration to it. Uh, even stuff like, you know, velocity tracking mm-hmm. integrations to it. So you can get away from any sort of uh, just pure perceptive RPE uh, ratings on it. Uh, that stuff will be a bit further further down the road. You know, you can, you can get so detailed and nuanced with, with a lot of this stuff. And it's like powerlifting is a pretty simple sport. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So so that stuff will be, be fun to have at some point, but but not really necessary. So it's, it's giving very individualized volume um, recommendations and frequency based on all of those individual differences um, and then adjusting it intra-session, intra-week. You know, what you did on your first squat day of the week is going to change what your second day looks like. What you do this week is going to change what next week looks like. The average of this entire training cycle this month is going to change what next month looks like. So. It makes a lot of uh, a lot of adjustments. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's excellent. The, the only drawback to stuff like that is uh, when people start to rely so much on data that they stop listening to themselves or stop, you know. Yeah. But I think in com- in combination uh, with that kind of awareness, I mean, we're gonna we're entering into a future of uh, of training that I think is going to uh, be phenomenal. It's a powerful tool for coaches, for sure. Absolutely powerful. You guys are doing great things. Thank you. Absolutely yeah. great. I mean, our our goal when we first started this this company was to highlight uh, first off us ourselves bring good information to the fitness space, but then to highlight people who know more than us in their specific in their in their specific areas of expertise, uh, just to get the word out because we we, we always talk about this, but we're fighting a battle right now with bad information, uh-huh. yep. shitty fitness information. And, 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 and we're trying to shift the fitness industry in the direction of, uh, you know, science and what works and what doesn't work. And I think you guys are one of the few guys that are, that are actually doing things right. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah we, uh, we take a lot of pride in, in what we do. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on chat. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, yeah, my man. pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to mind pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.